Usually families have a good evening and on comes dinner time, one of the best times, but when you look down into your stew and you see a finger floating around, you know something's gotta be off. This is the sinister case of Catherine Knight. Hello friend, and welcome back to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also aviation expertise. I'm colorblind, but you can definitely trust me flying the plane. Maybe. But today we're looking at the case of Catherine Knight, and by oh golly, is she an insane person. For the first time ever, we're heading overseas to Australia today. Our story starts in Aberdeen, New South Wales, which is a small town in the Upper Hunter region, and it's got a population of around 2,000 people. There's really not much going on here. I mean, they have a local rugby team, the Aberdeen Tigers. Go team! But Catherine Knight, who's also a twin and sister's name is Joy, was born on October 24th of 1955 to Barbara Raffan and Ken Knight. Her parents' relationship was a bit interesting because her mom cheated on her former husband Jack Raffan with Ken, and so Catherine was a child of wedlock. Barbara and Jack had four sons together, and Ken was a close friend and co-worker to Jack. Rumors started to spread around town about the affair, and because the town was very conservative and Christian, they got a ton of backlash for it. This forced Barbara and Ken to move, and Barbara left her four sons behind and went to Moore E, another town in New South Wales. To Together, Barbara and Ken would have four daughters, Catherine included. In 1959, Barbara's former husband Jack would pass away, and two of their sons were living with him, and so they would end up moving in with Barbara and Ken. In total, there were eight people living inside of a pretty small house, and it's been said that Ken was an alcoholic who was extremely violent towards Barbara and the children. Barbara would constantly talk to the children about this and the abuse that she endured and tell them things like how men were all the same and how much she hated all men. While Catherine was growing up and until about the age of 11, she was being abused by some family members, though it's not clear who. When she was finally old enough, she went to Muswell Brook High School and she was described as being a loner and a bully. Catherine apparently liked to pick on smaller kids, and while in school, she actually assaulted a boy with a weapon and somehow injured a teacher. At the age of 15, she would drop out of school, and at this point, she was pretty much illiterate and she couldn't read or write. Her dream job was to work at a slaughterhouse, and soon that dream would come true when she was hired by a local company, the Aberdeen Abolition. What a weird dream to have. Did nobody around her find that odd? But she was given her own set of butcher knives, which she decided to hang right over top of her bed. She said that they would always be handy if I need them. Once again, was nobody concerned about this? About three years later, in 1973, when Catherine was 18, she met David Kellett when he started working at the slaughterhouse. He was an alcoholic who had a severe drinking problem. Previously, he was working for the railways at Coffs Harbor, but then a train hit a school bus and killed six children. This was because he was drunk on the job and soon got fired because of it. Catherine and David would hit it off pretty well and immediately start dating. David sometimes actually, uh, had relations with Catherine's twin sister. Sister Joy supposedly because he got drunk and couldn't tell them apart. I'm baffled right now, but about a year later in 1974, Catherine and David got married and their wedding day was certainly something. Catherine showed up on her motorcycle and she found David at the altar, blackout drunk and he could barely stand. After they got married, Catherine's mom Barbara gave David some advice and if I were him, I would have took it and ran. She said, you better watch this one or she'll kill you. Stir her up the wrong way or do the wrong thing and you're f Don't ever think of playing up on her. She'll f***ing kill you. She's got a screw loose. Literally on the exact same day, the day that they got married, Catherine tried to strangle David to death after he fell asleep after having sex only three times. Only three times. But their relationship was incredibly toxic and violent, just like her parents. Catherine and David would soon find out that Catherine was pregnant with a baby girl who they were going to name Melissa. While Catherine was pregnant, she burned all of David's clothing and then hit him over the head with a frying pan because he arrived home late after being at a darts tournament. David ran away, got into his car and went to the hospital and then found out he had a fractured skull. The police wanted to charge Catherine, but she promised to David that she would change, and so David decided to drop all the charges against her. David, why? 
Shortly after this, their daughter Melissa would be born, and a few months later in May of 1976, David left Catherine for another woman, and together they moved to Queensland with his mother. David was tired of Catherine's BS, and the day after this happened, she had a mental breakdown. Catherine started pushing Melissa in her stroller down the main street in Aberdeen. She was going crazy and pushing the stroller in all sorts of ways before she decided to push the stroller completely over in front of a ton of people. Catherine was then put into a mental institution and diagnosed with postnatal depression and spent weeks in recovery. Soon she would get out and immediately take Melissa down to some nearby train tracks, place her on the tracks, get an ax from somewhere, and start chasing people down and threatening to kill them. A local man named Old Ted was the one who saved Melissa from being hit by a train. Catherine was then arrested and she was taken back to the mental institution, but she was released the next day. And get this, right? She was able to sign herself out of the hospital because they claimed that she had recovered. How? Why? Within a few days of being released for the second time, Catherine would strike again. She decided to take one of her butcher knives off the wall and she found the first woman she could who had a car. She sliced her across the face and then forced the woman to drive to Queensland in order to find David. Catherine and the woman would stop by a gas station and then the woman would somehow escape and call the police. By the time the police got there, Catherine had taken a mechanic hostage and said she was going to slice his neck because he repaired David's car. The police subdued her and she told them that she was traveling to Queensland to murder David and his mom. David was told about what Catherine's plan was, and so both him and his mom decided to move back to Aberdeen in order to take care of Catherine and help support her. She was trying to murder you guys. Why would you get closer to her? Catherine was then released from the mental institution in August of 1976, and this time she would stay out. About four years later, in March of 1980, Catherine and David would have a second baby girl named Natasha. Then about four years after that, in 1984, Catherine would end up leaving David for good. Catherine left David. Ah. Catherine would then rent an apartment close to where she worked, which was still the slaughterhouse, but then somehow would hurt her back. She would leave her house and then be given government housing somewhere in Aberdeen. Two years later in 1986, Catherine would meet another David, this time David Saunders. Within no time, him and his daughters moved into her apartment, but he still kept his own apartment located in Scone. Catherine and David would constantly argue, and she would kick him out, and then he would go back to his apartment, and then she would go beg for him, and this just kept happening over and over again. In May of 1987, Catherine sliced the throat of David's eight-week-old puppy right in front of him as a warning sign to what would happen to him if he ever left her or cheated on her. Right after this, she hit him in the head with a frying pan and knocked him unconscious. What a terrible person, hurting animals and she really, really likes frying pans. For some reason, David decided to stay with her, and in June of 1988, they would have their only child together, which was a girl named Sarah. Catherine and David needed to get a new house because of this, and David put a down payment on one, and Catherine paid it off with her workers' compensation. She decided to decorate it in animal skins, machetes, rakes, pitchforks, and a ton of other random things. One day, a really bad fight between Catherine and David happened, and she hit him in the face with an iron and then stabbed him in the stomach with a pair of scissors. David immediately took a leave of absence from his work, and then he disappeared fearing for his life. Catherine had tried to find him, but nobody would tell her where he was. So a few months go by, and then David decided to try and go back to their house to see their daughter. But as soon as he got there, he was arrested and served with a restraining order, and now he wasn't allowed to talk to Catherine or Sarah. Catherine went to the police and told them that she was afraid of David. What? For the next few years, it appears as if Catherine was somewhat normal. She had a co-worker at the slaughterhouse named John Chillingworth, and they had a bit of a fling together. They dated for about three years or so and actually had a son together named Eric. But soon Catherine would leave John for another John named John Price. I guess she really likes people who have the same name. John Price was known through Aberdeen as being a terrific bloke and everyone who knew him really liked him. He had three children from a previous marriage that ended in 1988 and his first wife got custody of their youngest daughter. John's two older children lived with him and about two years later, Catherine would move in with her children. John was making good money at his job for 17 years and him and Catherine would argue a lot but were seen by family and friends as having a great relationship at first. They would constantly argue because John wouldn't ask her to marry him because John just wasn't interested in getting married again. So Catherine videotaped a bunch of things that John had taken out of the garbage from his work 
and she sent it to his boss. His boss had no choice but to fire him, and this left John heartbroken. Immediately, he went home and kicked Catherine out and told his friends and family what she did. For some reason, about two months later, they would get back together, but John refused to live with her and said they had to live separately. The arguing between them got much worse, and because John was with her, his friends and family refused to talk to him. In February of 2000, Catherine and John were arguing when she stabbed him in the chest. John then threw her out of the house and told her the relationship was officially over. The very next day, he went down to the magistrate's court and got a restraining order against Catherine. After this, he went to work and he told his co-workers that if he doesn't come into work the next day, it's because Catherine murdered him. His co-workers actually begged him not to go home and said they could stay with them or get a motel, but John said he had no choice. He said he needed to return home to his children because if he didn't, Catherine would want to hurt them. But when John got home, he found out that Catherine sent his children to a sleepover at a friend's house, which I don't understand. Was he not concerned about this? And what about the restraining order? But he decided to hang out with a friend that night who also lived right across the street and at around 11 p.m. decided to go home and go to bed. Catherine would soon show up to his house wearing a pair of black lingerie. She snuck into the house for a bit and then watched him sleep and then woke him up to do the dirty. After this, he then fell back asleep and Catherine began to fall through with her plan. She took out her butcher knives and then stabbed John 37 times. I'm not going to get super into detail about what Catherine did to him, but it is awful, just awful. At around 6 a.m., John's neighbor and friend, who he was hanging out with the night before, noticed John's car was still in the driveway. Knowing he was supposed to be at work, the neighbor became worried and called the police. The neighbor and a co-worker of John's went to his house to check on him and tried to get into the home, but it was locked and all the windows were blocked off. The police would arrive on the scene at around 8 in the morning and then break down the back door to get inside. They started looking around and what they would see would stick with them for the rest of their lives. There was a curtain in the doorway that led to the living room and an officer moved it over to see and saw it was covered in blood. He then realized that it wasn't a curtain and it was actually John who had been skinned alive and hung in the doorway. Catherine also cooked different parts of him and investigators found the dining room table set for all of John's children. His head was inside of a warming pot on the stove with a bunch of vegetables ready to be made into a stew. Catherine left a note saying, time go you back. Johanthon for wrapping my doubter. You two Beck for Ross for little John. Now play with little John's John Price. Once again, she was illiterate, so her spelling was terrible. And she also apparently tried to eat him but then threw the plate out in the backyard. The police found Catherine in bed and she was in a coma from taking a bunch of pills. Apparently, the first responding police officers actually ended up quitting a few days later because of what they saw. When Catherine finally awoke, she was soon interviewed by police, so here's some of that. I don't remember anything. Do you recall yourself going to bed? Finally. Catherine was arraigned on March 2nd of 2001 for the murder of John Price, and she pleaded not guilty. The trial started a few months later in October, and a ton of the jurors didn't want to see the evidence due to its graphic nature, and so the jury was impaneled. Catherine's attorney then announced she was changing her plea to guilty, so there was no need for a jury. A few months later, on November 8th of 2001, Catherine Knight was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. This was the first time in Australia's history that a woman has ever been given in a sentence like this. In June of 2006, Catherine tried to appeal her life sentence by claiming that the penalty didn't suit the crime. What? I've had it with this woman. The court said no and replied, this was an appalling crime, almost beyond contemplation in a civilized society. Not almost, just beyond. It's insane. Also, John Price was found in court of not rapping anybody, so yeah. But John Price was a seemingly nice guy who was liked by everyone he knew. He was a hard worker who crossed paths with a real life demon. Meeting Catherine ended up costing him not only his job, but his entire life. I hope that John's resting peacefully. And as for Catherine, phew, what a crazy bitch. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. I also have a second account with my brother named Horrifying where we tell stories about everything paranormal. This includes true crime, mysteries, and things that are just downright spooky. I'd greatly appreciate if you subscribe to that too. The link's in my bio. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.